metal sphere placed in orbit by a Russian rocket. Here an artist's conception of how the feat was accomplished. A three-stage rocket. Number one, the booster in the class of an intercontinental missile. Its weight estimated at 50 tons. The smaller second stage took over at 5,000 miles an hour and carried on to the highest point reached. 500 miles up, the artificial moon is boosted to a speed counterbalancing the pull of gravity and released. You are hearing the actual signals transmitted by the Earth-circling satellite. One of the great scientific feats of the age. The launch of Sputnik 1 in October of 1957, and the launch of the even more massive and impressive Sputnik 2 just a few weeks later, was a triumph for the Soviet Union, and a shock and surprise for the United States. And such a, a challenge had to elicit a response. And so the United States went ahead with plans to launch the Vanguard satellite, Project Vanguard, in December. Unfortunately, that launch did not go very well. The first successful U.S. satellite was Explorer 1, launched by von Braun's team um, in January of 1958. But that didn't remove the shock of Sputnik. From the very dawn of the space age, the United States was playing catch-up with the Soviet Union. This is the world of 1960, just a couple of years after Sputnik. The blue countries, the dark blue countries, are the United States and its principal allies, the members of NATO. And the light blue countries are countries that are more or less aligned with this Western alliance. The red countries are the Soviet Union and its core allies, the, the, um, uh, the members of the Warsaw Pact in Eastern Europe. And the, the light red, the pink countries, are countries that are aligned with the Soviet bloc. The gray countries are independent countries that are not aligned, and the green regions are places that are not yet independent countries, although most of them will be independent within a decade. This is a world that is dominated by a superpower competition, a competition in political, military, economic, technological, and ideological spheres. It's a multidimensional conflict, and, it's, and it, um, it dominates, the conflict dominates the um, the, the, the politics of the world. And it even dominates the politics of the United States. The 1960 election turns, in part, on the perception that there's a missile gap between the United States and the Soviet Union, that the Soviet Union is ahead and is getting farther and farther ahead as it produces missiles upon missiles and threatens the safety and security of the United States. Part of the American response was already underway. The National Aeronautics and Space Administration, a civilian agency founded in 1958 by the Eisenhower administration. This was to coordinate in one place the American efforts at spaceflight. So it incorporated uh, the aeronautical and space research projects of the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics and for the Air Force and so on, plus elements of the Army's ballistic missile program, headed by von Braun, and the Jet Propulsion Laboratory at Caltech. NASA undertook two early projects for human spaceflight. One of them was Project Mercury, the effort to put a human being into orbit. And the other was the X-15 program, which NASA shared with the United States Air Force. Unfortunately, as happened all too often in those days, the Soviets were ahead.
On April 12, 1961, Soviet Union launched Vostok 1, carrying a cosmonaut, Yuri Gagarin, who completed one orbit of the Earth and then re-entered. After re-entry at about 20,000 feet, he ejected from the spacecraft and, according to plan, uh, parachuted to the ground. A human being had orbited the Earth. And, a few months later, a second cosmonaut, German Titov, orbited the Earth 17 times in Vostok 2. Unfortunately, NASA and Project Mercury were not yet ready to carry an astronaut into orbit. The Mercury spacecraft was ready, but the launch vehicle, the Atlas, was not yet reliable enough to carry an astronaut safely. It had a tendency to blow up. So they did what they could. They decided to put a Mercury spacecraft on top of an intermediate-range ballistic missile, the Redstone, and launch it on the 5th of May, 1961. Alan Shepard became the first American to cross the Kármán line into space. He reached an altitude of 188 kilometers and flew almost 500 kilometers downrange from the launch point. And then, um, a couple of months later, came a second suborbital flight of a Mercury on a Redstone where Gus Grissom flew about the same distance. Here's a nice diagram that shows the relative size of the Mercury and Vostok spacecraft. The Vostok, we're just seeing the, the, the um, passenger module. They're about the same size. The Vostok is a little larger, but of course it, um, it uh, has to be a little bit larger on the inside because it has to have an ejection seat so that the pilot can, can leave the spacecraft and parachute to safety at the end of the flight. With Shepard safely back on the ground, President Kennedy decided that it was now time to address Congress and to call for dramatic increases in space efforts by the United States to challenge the Soviet Union to a space race. The dramatic achievements in space which occurred in recent weeks should have made clear to us all, as did the Sputnik in 1957, the impact of this adventure on the minds of men everywhere who are attempting to make a determination of which road they should take. Since early in my term, our efforts in space have been under review. With the advice of the Vice President, who is chairman of the National Space Council, we have examined where we are strong and where we are not, where we may succeed and where we may not. Now it is time to take longer strides, time for a great new American enterprise, time for this nation to take a clearly leading role in space achievement, which in many ways may hold the key to our future on Earth. I believe we possess all the resources and talents necessary, but the facts of the matter are that we have never made the national decisions or marshaled the national resources required for such leadership. We have never specified long-range goals on an urgent time schedule or managed our resources and our time so as to ensure their fulfillment. I therefore ask the Congress above and beyond the increases I have earlier requested for space activities to provide the funds which are needed to meet the following national goals. First, I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the earth. No single space project in this period will be more impressive to mankind 
or more important for the long-range exploration of space, and none will be so difficult or expensive to accomplish. Later, in a speech in Houston, Texas, Kennedy outlined some of the great challenges of such a goal. But why some say the moon? Why choose this as our goal? And they may well ask, why climb the highest mountain? Why, 35 years ago, fly the Atlantic? Why does Rice play Texas? We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills. Because that challenge is one that we're willing to accept, one we are unwilling to postpone, and one we intend to win, and the others too. We shall send to the moon 240,000 miles away from the control station in Houston, a giant rocket more than 300 feet tall, the length of this football field, made of new metal alloys, some of which have not yet been invented, capable of standing heat and stresses several times more than have ever been experienced, fitted together with a precision better than the finest watch, carrying all the equipment needed for propulsion, guidance, control, communications, food, and survival on an untried mission to an unknown celestial body, and then return it safely to Earth, re-entering the atmosphere at speeds of over 25,000 miles per hour, causing heat about half that on the temperature of the sun, almost as hot as it is here today, and do all this, and do all this, and do it right, and do it first before this decade is out, then we must be bold. In 1962, the Americans finally reached orbit. First John Glenn in February, then Scott Carpenter in May, made orbital flights atop a launcher derived from an Atlas ICBM. And there were two more flights in 1963. In the last of them, Gordon Cooper made 22 orbits, breaking the Soviets' record, and re-entered under manual control after there was a system failure. Mercury was on its way. But the Soviets, of course, were not idle. The Russians chalk up another victory in the space race as they put two manned spacecraft into orbit within 24 hours of each other. Colonel Pavel Popovich and Major Andrian Nikolayev follow in the footsteps of two other Russian astronauts, Titov and Gagarin, and thus give the Soviets four manned orbital flights against two for the United States. Within 72 hours, the first man aloft traveled more than a million miles, four times the distance to the moon, a distance it would take a jet airliner two and a half months to fly. As Vostok 3rd orbited, Vostok 4 followed on its heels, at one time within 75 miles, proving that a contact in outer space was possible. Tracking stations indicate that there is little doubt of the success of the Russian feat that is seen as two years ahead of the U.S. effort. In the period 1962 to 63 saw other Soviet firsts, including Vostok 6, which carried the first female cosmonaut, Valentina Tereshkova. The Soviets were ahead. Then there's the X-15. The X-15 was a high-altitude hypersonic rocket plane that was developed by the Air Force and then also later used by NASA. And the X-15 was dropped by um, a B-52 bomber at, at high altitude and pretty high speeds, about two-thirds the speed of sound. And then it would ignite its own rocket motor and go much higher and much faster. Uh, in the 1960s, there were about 200 flights of the X-15 aerospace plane. Uh, and uh, the, the fastest speed that it achieved there was 
7,200 kilometers per hour. That's Mach 6.7. And the maximum altitude it achieved was 108 kilometers above the surface of the Earth, well above the Kármán line. So how many X-15 astronauts were there? Well, it depends on your definition. Um, if you use the Air Force's definition, uh, then about eight pilots uh, went into space in the X-15. If you adopt the international uh, definition, then one pilot, Joe Walker, um, uh, went into space twice in the X-15 in 1963. There were quite a number of pilots of the X-15, and several of them went on to travel into space uh, in other missions. For example, uh, this fellow here at the, uh, um, in front of the X-15 on the ground is a pilot named Neil Armstrong, who would later become a somewhat notable NASA astronaut. The other thing NASA was doing in the early 1960s was figuring out how to get to the moon. There were basically three ways to do it. The first is the direct way. You launch a rocket from the Earth, it flies to the Moon, and lands on it. The spacecraft that launches from the Earth lands on the Moon and then returns. The only problem with the direct method is that you need a really big rocket. Um, and uh, Von Braun was prepared to build such a rocket. He had begun to design it. He called it the Nova. The second method of getting to the moon was called Earth Orbit Rendezvous. And in that case, you assemble a spacecraft to go to the moon in Earth orbit. Then you launch the astronauts up to rendezvous with this spacecraft, and then that spacecraft flies to the moon and lands on it, and then returns to Earth orbit, and then the um, astronauts return to Earth. So this is a little bit more complicated because it requires you to rendezvous and dock spacecraft it requires you to actually attach spacecraft together in Earth orbit, and that's more complicated, but you can get by with a somewhat smaller launch vehicle. The third method of getting to the moon is called lunar orbit rendezvous, and it's the most challenging method of the three. It requires you to have a lunar landing spacecraft and a Earth launching spacecraft and return spacecraft, two spacecraft just like Earth orbit rendezvous, but here the whole set of spacecraft goes into lunar orbit and the lunar spacecraft detaches and lands on the moon and then returns and rendezvous and docks with the Earth return spacecraft in lunar orbit. In other words, the spacecraft rendezvous and docking, which is a very complex maneuver, happens not on the Earth a few hundred kilometers up, but happens hundreds of thousands of kilometers away in orbit around the moon. Nevertheless, there are great advantages. You can get by with only an enormous rocket, not a super-duper enormous rocket, for lunar orbit rendezvous. And in the end, that is the method that they adopted in 1962. Project Apollo officially adopted lunar orbit rendezvous as the way to get to the moon. Of course, getting to the moon is a long way off. There are lots of steps between here and there, and one of the first steps is to figure out how to get into orbit with more than one person at a time. The Russians, as usual, got there first. The Soviet Union launched in 1964 Voshkod-1, which was basically a, a Vostok in which you've crammed three people into the spacecraft at one time. It was very cramped, and it was a shirt-sleeved environment. That is to say, the cosmonauts did not wear spacesuits because there simply was not room for it. But the crew included not just a pilot, but also an engineer and a physician. And then, um, uh, uh, less than a year later, Voshkod 2 was launched. It only carried two cosmonauts in spacesuits. And in 1965, Alexei Leonov became the first human being to walk in space, to leave the spacecraft and go outside 
in um, in Earth orbit. This is called an EVA, an extravehicular activity. It was an extraordinary sensation. I had never felt quite like it before. I was free above the planet Earth, and I saw it, so it was rotating majestically below me. The American response was Project Gemini. Um, between 1965 and 1966, the Gemini spacecraft flew 10 times with human beings in it. And, and each um, Gemini capsule carried two people. It was a, a, about the same shape as a Mercury spacecraft, but it was a little bit larger. And the interior was about the size of a, of a small sports car. Its launch vehicle was a Titan II. So Gemini had several goals for the project. One was to just have a larger crew and to, and to fly for a longer duration. And it was also um, designed to practice operations of human beings in spaceflight, including uh, greater control of the pilot over the maneuvers of the spacecraft. And finally, Gemini was supposed to learn and perfect the techniques of rendezvous, docking, and orbit change, techniques that were going to be necessary if the U.S. was to send astronauts to the moon. There were quite a number of milestones of Project Gemini. Gemini 4 had the first U.S. spacewalk. Ed White went out into the, uh, in, in, in his spacesuit um, and, and uh, maneuvered around near the, uh, near the, um, near the Gemini spacecraft with, uh, with a little handheld compressed air gun. Um, Gemini 6 and 7 um, made rendezvous, flew um, within uh, a, a, a couple of hundred feet of each other, and, and kept together. They did what's called station keeping um, by two spacecraft. That was the first time that the U.S. had flown two missions at the same time. Gemini 7 actually spent two weeks in orbit. Um, Gemini 8 was the first one that docked with another vehicle an Agena upper stage vehicle that had been launched for the purpose. They, they docked with it. Uh, the pilot was Neil Armstrong. He was the first person to, to join together two spacecraft in orbit. Unfortunately, soon after that, um, uh, the attitude control thrusters on the, um, on the uh, uh, Gemini spacecraft started going crazy, and, uh, and they started spinning. In fact, by the end, they were spinning uh, almost once per second, and he had to cut away the the Agena vehicle, and, um, and uh, they made an emergency um, re-entry and uh, came home a bit early. But other um, Gemini missions went beautifully. Gemini 11, for example, docked with the Agena vehicle and then used its rocket motor to make a major orbit change, raising the uh, maximum altitude of the orbit by, uh, to uh, 1,370 kilometers, which was at the time the farthest that any human being had ever been from the Earth. If you're going to the moon, you need a really big rocket. And so this is the era of the really biggest rockets that so far have ever been launched. The first one is the Soviet N-1. It was designed by Korolev's OKB-1 Design Bureau specifically for sending missions to the moon and to launch an orbital space station. Um, uh, two of the goals of the Soviet program. The mass was 2.7 million kilograms. It was more than 100 meters high. And that first stage had 30 rocket motors, and the second stage had eight rocket motors. And, and, um, and all these rocket motors were running off of, of kerosene and liquid oxygen. It was a four-stage rocket, it was truly, truly enormous. And this is not just a, a design concept. They built this. They launched this. Here, for example, is a U.S. spy satellite image of the N-1 on its launch pad in 1969. The American entry in the really big rocket competition 
was the Saturn V. It was designed by von Braun's team in Huntsville, and it had a mass of 2.8 million kilograms, and it was 110 meters high. The first stage was propelled by five of the largest rocket engines that have ever been built to this day, and um, uh, uh, the, uh, the F1 engines that ran off of, of kerosene and liquid oxygen. The second and third stages um, ran off of hydrogen and, and oxygen. And the third stage had a restart capability so that it could first put the spacecraft into Earth orbit and then fire again to send the spacecraft on to the moon. For a couple of years in the 1960s, between 1966 and um, 1968, there was a period of one catastrophe after another in both the Soviet and American space um, programs. It began with the, the sudden and unexpected death of Sergei Korolev. He was going in for, for some fairly routine surgery, but he started bleeding internally. The surgeon was not skilled enough, although he was politically very powerful, the surgeon was not skilled enough to, to correct it. And when he opened Korolev's abdomen to try to, to stop the bleeding, he found a massive tumor, and Korolev died on the table. So with the death of one human being, the Soviet space program suffered a tremendous blow because Korolev had been the guiding spirit from the then, about a year later, the Americans suffered an even more horrifying setback. During a ground test in the Apollo 1 spacecraft, there was a severe fire inside the cabin, a fast fire fed by the high-pressure, pure oxygen atmosphere. And, and the astronauts were not able to get out. And so the three astronauts, Chafee, Grissom, and White, were burned to death. It was a, a, a terrible blow, both because of the loss of the spacecraft. White had been the first man to walk in, uh, first American to walk in space, and, and uh, Grissom had been the second American into space. But even more so, it showed that there were terrible problems with the Apollo spacecraft. Then, just a few months later, the Soviets launched their next designed spacecraft the Soyuz spacecraft, which would eventually be designed to carry up to three people. And it was flown the, in the first mission by a single pilot, Vladimir Komarov. And he flew, the mission flew into space, but then on re-entry, his parachute failed to open for the spacecraft, and he was killed as the spacecraft plowed into the ground at high speed. In November of that year, the X-15 program suffered catastrophic failure. Um, Major Mike Adams of the Air Force was killed when his X-15 lost control during its re-entry into the atmosphere. The, the controls had been had been redesigned and uh, Adams uh, caused his spacecraft to to go at an angle. By the time he ran into the atmosphere, he was coming in sideways, and that caused him to go into a, a hypersonic flat spin from which he never recovered. The craft crashed and he was killed. Um, there were only a, a few X-15 flights after this. And finally, the Soviet N-1 rocket, the rocket that was supposed to carry them to the moon, exploded upon launch, both in February and again in July of 1969, one of the largest non-nuclear explosions in history. So the result of this, the aftermath of all this, was that everyone brought things to a stop. Both the Soyuz and the Apollo spacecraft required extensive redesign and rebuilding uh, um, to, to, to correct the, the safety flaws that had killed their occupants. The X-15 program 
was ended in 1968, just a few months after Major Adams um, uh, had, his, had his crash. And in fact, at this point, without the N1 to carry them to the moon, the Soviet lunar program was abandoned. But the Americans bounced back, and after a year and a half of agonizing reappraisal and round-the-clock work, the new Apollo spacecraft was ready to fly. The Apollo spacecraft was really two spacecraft. There's the command service module, um, which was the, uh, the, the main spacecraft, and uh, Earth return vehicle. That's the, the conical command module on the cylindrical uh, service module. And then there was the lunar module, a spacecraft unlike any spacecraft that had ever been built. It, it had um, uh, both a descent and an ascent stage, two, two uh, um, uh, rocket motors, and, um, and it, was, it was like nothing else. It was the first true space vehicle. It was designed never to fly in an atmosphere, only in outer space no aerodynamic streamlining. And in fact, it was too delicate to operate in the gravitational field of the Earth. Its domain was outer space and the surface of the moon. Here's the mission profile, what an Apollo mission to the moon looks like. It starts out with a launch to orbit using the Saturn V. And once everything checks out in orbit, then comes translunar injection, TLI, where the upper stage of the Saturn, the S-4B, fires again and sends the spacecraft on its way to the moon. The Apollo spacecraft, uh, both the command module and the lunar module, separate from the upper stage. And, um, and, and then, when they reach the moon, they fire the rocket motor of the service module to go into lunar orbit. That's lunar orbit insertion. Then two of the astronauts enter the lunar module and descend to the lunar surface, land on the lunar surface, and spend one to three days there. After that, they take off, return to orbit, rendezvous with the command service module, and transfer themselves and the samples they've taken from the lunar surface to the command and service module. Then the service module engine is fired again, for trans-Earth insertion, leaving lunar orbit and returning to Earth. As they approach the Earth, the command module separates from the service module and re-enters on its own, landing in the ocean on parachutes. It's complicated. In fact, it's way too complicated to get it all right the first time. So the first several missions of the Apollo program were rehearsals, practice missions, to try out different elements of this very complicated mission profile. First came Apollo 7 in October 1968, where the command and service module was sent into Earth orbit to be checked out by its crew. Then came Apollo 8 in December, where a Saturn V took the command service module into lunar orbit, and then they returned. After that came Apollo 9. The command service module and the lunar module were put into Earth orbit to check out rendezvous and docking to check out the behavior of both spacecraft. And finally, Apollo 10 in May 1969, a full dress rehearsal for the lunar landing. The Saturn V sent the command service module and lunar module into lunar orbit, the lunar module detached and approached within 15 kilometers of the lunar surface, then returned. For my money, the most adventurous of these rehearsal expeditions was Apollo 8, the first launch of human beings on a Saturn V, the first time that astronauts had ever left Earth orbit, the first people to see the moon up close, and the Earth from far away, a truly remarkable adventure. With the success of all these missions, it was time to attempt a landing on the surface of the moon.
On July 16, 1969, Saturn V carried Apollo 11, crewed by Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin, and Michael Collins, on their way to the moon. The voyage to the moon went well, about as planned, and on July 19th, they fired the service module engine to put them into orbit around the moon. Then Armstrong and Aldrin entered the lunar module and began to power up the system. And the next day, July 20th, they detached and began their descent to the lunar surface. Coming up nine minutes. We're now in the approach phase. Everything looking good. Altitude 4200. Houston, you're a go for landing. Over. 40 feet down, two and a half. Picking up some dust. 30 feet, two and a half down. Straight shadow. Four forward. Four forward. Drift into the right a little. Straight down a half. 30 seconds. Forward. Good. Straight. Contact right. Tranquility base here. The angle has landed. That's one small step for man. One giant leap for A man on the moon in the decade of the 1960s. Kennedy's goal had been met. But the Apollo program was far from over. In December 1969, Apollo 12 landed in a pinpoint landing on the Mare Imbrium region of the moon within walking distance of the Surveyor robot probe that had landed there a couple of years earlier. And Apollo 13 followed in April of 1970. Apollo 13 is famous because of the tremendous explosion that took place in the service module, blowing up an oxygen tank on their way to the moon. The uh, astronauts had to abort the mission. They were able to use the lunar module life support system as a kind of lifeboat and swing round the moon and return to Earth. Another fantastic adventure. But even with such spectacular achievements, the public interest in the Apollo program was beginning to wane, even as the program was nearing its greatest achievements. Beginning with Apollo 14, the Probably lunar lander began to try to land in much more interesting and difficult yeah, geological terrain. And beginning with Apollo 15, they began to extend their stays to three days on a lunar surface and carry on long-distance exploration with a lunar roving vehicle that they carried folded up in a sort of equipment bay of the lunar module. When Apollo 17 lifted off from the moon in December 1972, it took the last Apollo astronauts to walk on the moon. That was almost 50 years ago, and since that time, no human being has touched the surface of another world. 
While the Americans were going to the moon, the Soviets were pursuing an ambitious program of their own in Earth orbit. In 1968, Soyuz 3 rendez made rendezvous with an unmanned Soyuz 2. And then the following January, Soyuz 4 and 5 became the first docking of two piloted spacecraft, beating the Apollo 9 Command Service Module and Lunar Module by several months. And crew actually transferred from one to the other. Um, cosmonauts that came up in one spacecraft went down in the other. And then in late 1969, Soyuz 6, 7, and 8 flew simultaneously, seven cosmonauts at one time, and in many spacewalks, they began to demonstrate space construction techniques with the view to creating uh, orbital stations, space stations, in orbit around the Earth. And finally, in 1971, Soyuz 11 docked with Salyut, the small Soviet space station, and stayed there for 23 days setting an endurance record in space. Unfortunately, during re-entry, a valve came open and they lost pressure in the cabin and the crew was killed. The American space station program was called Skylab. Skylab was launched about two years after Salyut on the top of the last Saturn V to fly. And during the deployment of the complex space station from the top of that rocket, it underwent a lot of damage. The, some of the heat shielding on the outside was stripped off, and one of the solar panel arms was just completely torn from the, from the laboratory. So when the first crew went up to Skylab um, a few weeks later, their job was to repair it, to make an almost unusable space habitat into one where astronauts could live and work for weeks or months at a time, and they succeeded. They, they were able to, to open the remaining solar panel, and they were able to add additional heat shielding to the outside. They were the first of three crews that um, stayed in Skylab over the next year. The third crew actually stayed for almost three months, and during this time they um, did many experiments on the human adaptation to zero gravity, on um, solar astronomy, uh, material science, and, and a dozen other scientific fields. Skylab was a truly impressive achievement. But the true end of the Apollo era was the ASTP, the Apollo-Soyuz Test Project. The tensions of the 1950s and 1960s had thawed a bit. The 1970s were the age of superpower detente. And one of the most visible signs of this was a joint space mission, a, a docking of an Apollo spacecraft and a Soyuz spacecraft in orbit around the Earth. And this was to, to practice for future joint space operations, to demonstrate rendezvous between the two, um, the two space programs and, and the interoperability of their equipment. And in many ways, the, that, that moment when they open the hatch in the docking adapter between the two spacecraft, and when Deke Slayton, one of the original Mercury astronauts of the United States, shakes the hand of Alexei Leonov, the Soviet cosmonaut who was the first human being to walk in space. That, that handshake is the end of the space race. It was the end of an era. And one of the most poignant things about that, that era that, that ended in 1975 were the roads not taken. The projects that had been proposed had even perhaps been built, but had never flown. For example, the Air Force X-20 Dinosaur project was a, was a hypersonic space plane with orbital capability, a follow-on to the X-15. 
and the Soviet Spiral MiG-105 aerospace plane was its own analog to the X-15, X-20 project. It was built, but never flown. The Air Force planned to use Gemini technology in a manned orbiting laboratory, a, a uh, space station of the 1960s, but that project was canceled in the middle of the 1960s amid the great expense of the Vietnam War. And the Apollo program itself had originally included three more missions, Apollos 18, 19, and 20, to further explore the moon, including some, some fascinating places that they never got to, and to demonstrate long-stay capability, staying 7, 10, 14 days. And finally, the United States had a program to build nuclear rocket engines, the NERVA program. And indeed, they built such engines and tested them on the ground. But in 1972, amid the, the great budget cuts at the end of the Apollo program, that program, too, was canceled. So that's the story of human spaceflight up to about 1975, the Apollo-Soyuz test project. It's a, a remarkable story. It's, a, it's a fueled by a gigantic geopolitical competition between superpowers, and a kind of competition that has very few parallels in history. It's a way of, if you will, fighting a war without fighting a war, a way the superpowers could compete without using their nuclear arsenals. It's a remarkable story also because of all the failures and successes involved and the, the, the tragedies and the triumphs. And it ends in a remarkable note of cooperation, something that I don't think that that dedicated Cold Warrior, John Kennedy, foresaw at the beginning.